Hello and welcome to the next in our series of fireside chats with our preacher from today's pre-recorded Eucharist for the second Sunday after Pentecost, the Reverend Joe White. Hello Richard. Good to have you with us Joe. Thank you for your ministry to us this morning in church. It was lovely. It was yeah. my pleasure. Is that the first time you've preached in the cathedral? It is. Yeah. yeah it was delightful. Yeah. It's a beautiful space, isn't it? Mm. Liturgically. Yeah, we're very lucky very lucky and thank you for what you brought to us and uh, Joe is as well as uh, being the rector of the parish of Phillip Island and Bass she's also the area dean of the beautiful southern region of the Diocese of Gippsland it's all beautiful in Gippsland but the south has its own particular je ne sais quoi isn't it Joe it's a yes. lovely a lovely part of the world tell us about uh, what it means to be a regional Dean, which you've been for about a year now. Well, I work with the Archdeacon, Graham Knott, and that is an absolute pleasure. We, we get on really well together and um, significantly in my role, I help him to work through the issues related to the Southern region um, and to support him as a member of the priesthood, but also in his role um, of leading the, um, the southern region and his particular area of ministry um, leadership which is to do with um, people who are aspiring to become can candidates for ministry and people who actually take the path to, min to ordination mm -hmm. and so that's um, a joyous thing for me to be part of um, and he makes that job really easy. I also um, have responsibility for uh, preparing the deanery meetings the last one we had was uh, at Coronella just before the lockdown. And we had mm. Catherine Mustin came and it was a really great session because she talked to us about how we could stay connected with vulnerable people yeah. uh, just as we were starting lockdown. So that was, that was fantastic. And at those meetings, not only do we have the guest speaker, speakers who I arrange, but I also arrange for there to be a shared lunch and also a shared Eucharist. So that's a really valuable thing that we do. We're missing that and we're hoping that we'll be able to have a deanery meeting in July. And that's not just for clergy, is it? You have a lot of lay people coming yeah. to those yeah. deanery meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And I also try to keep in touch with the, the clergy. Graham and I share that. So um, there's some people that he connects better with than I do. And so we just between us, yeah. we keep connected to them and, and try to bring out the best in them and to help them when they're having tough times as well. So, mm. yeah. It's a valuable so, and important ministry that we share. Yeah, it is absolutely, and, and, and part of the, the team as well, and, and thinking through, you know, bigger picture issues for the diocese, and you know, working working together with our other colleagues across the regions. It's, it's a great uh, great team effort, and during the COVID situation, especially, it's been it's been lovely to know that that you guys have been reaching out to the, the local clergy in your regions as well as you know, me trying to ring around and, and keep in touch with. People. So it's a great, uh, great pastoral ministry to share, isn't it? Yeah. Joe, in your parish work, at, at, um, you're based in Cowes, and you've got three centres in your in your parish. And I guess um, around that area of Victoria, it's quite seasonal, isn't it? You were talking about the seasons this morning in your homily, and um, but not just the church seasons, that the actual weather seasons have a big impact on on the kind of uh, feel of, of, of your part of the world. You'd have a lot of people come in for summer, I guess, and holiday makers, but you've probably also got a, a, a bunch of weekenders who, who come and go a bit, and then you've got the, the local residents. So it's quite an itinerant, you know, changeable population. What's it like doing parish ministry in a context like that? Well, <laughs> I think that the exciting thing about being down there is that every now and again you preach to 150 people. Yeah. And I didn't know this before because I've actually been in quite small congregations in my other parishes. Um, and to, to arrive on the first Easter to 150 people in this space, I was just elated. I was, I was so surprised because I know that God has placed on my heart this um, preaching the good news and sharing the good news with people in that public way. Um, but I didn't realise that it needed to be lots and lots of people, but clearly the, the life-giving energy that was 
those big events, mm. just went, oh, I meant to be doing this. It was just, it was really, it was really in, in, in inspiring for me personally. Um, yeah, so that's a great thing. Um, and we've got a huge parish hall where we can mm. house people. It was, it's lots of fun having all these visitors. Mm. Sometimes they come back and back and back. Yeah. So you see people, I've only been there for two and a half years now, but the people come back, um, like you said about the weekenders. Mm. Um, people come at the weekend and uh, they try you out and they think, oh, I wonder what she'll be like. Um, and wonder what this congregation is going to be like and they enjoy it and so they come back every weekend, which is nice. So you yeah. can start to build a relationship. Oh yeah, you do. You do build relationships with people who have holiday homes and then those holiday homes become their retirement home. And so they, they live on the island and because they've had great experiences in church, they come every, every single time and they, they join in with the community of the church. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned some of the other parishes that you've served in and, and most of your ministry has been in, in Gippsland, not, not all of it. You, you started out in, in Melbourne, mm -hmm. so we'll go back to that. But I think everywhere you've been, Joe, you've, you've not been afraid to initiate change. And, in your sermon this morning, you spoke of, of uh, growth and the, and the blessings of this um, ordinary time and the green seas and all those lovely images of growth and the harvest. But you also importantly touched on the fact that growth has its own challenges and, and cost. Mm -hmm. Growth can be painful, you know, growing pains. Um, growth means change, and as Anglicans, perhaps we're not very good at change. But but you kind of embrace change as a, as a gift, as an opportunity. Tell us a little bit about how you manage change in your leadership role. Well, I think firstly it's really important to tune in to two things. To tune in to what the Holy Spirit is prompting and have to tune in to what the people are saying and not saying. So and putting those two together yeah. takes a lot of discernment and prayerfulness putting those things together, then the path of change, the challenges of change, seem to be more defined. Yeah. The steps to change seem to be defined. Whenever change is you know, on, the, on the agenda, people get frightened, of course they do. Um, but when, when I as the leader know that this is the right change. It's not just for fashion or, or because yeah. it'll look good or something, or, you know, or we'll get more bums on seats or whatever that, you know. It's not something flippant. It actually comes from that place of discernment. Mm. So when, when as a leader I, I'm solid in that, um, then people feel confident about the moving forward, the challenges, the pain of the, of the growth. And I think too, that when people um, are not so comfy and they come and talk to me and maybe challenge me and go, oh, I don't think you should do that, that's wrong, mm -hmm. um, I can feel comfortable hearing their pain and not not being wobbled by it, not yeah. being, oh, not because I, yeah. yeah, I'm not knocked off by it because I think, mm -hmm. no, this is actually what we should be doing. Oh, look, that's not to say oh, I've got this you know, ironclad way it's going to be mm. because I think the important part about managing change is to keep listening, to keep listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and keep listening to the promptings of the people and sometimes that sort of makes the navigation a bit wobbly but yeah. the goal is still in sight, whatever that goal is. Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're a leader who really values the, the church's traditions and, and sometimes I think it's easy for us to think that tradition is somehow antithetical to change, but I like to think of tradition as the church's technical term for change. It, it helps us to define the way we change and the centre from which we grow, and it provides those broader parameters for our change and our growth. Because if we stand still, we, we get paralysed, we ossify, we become brutal. So tradition's about you know, learning to change in such a way that you're being faithful to the past and those who come before, but you're also honouring the present moment and open listening for what the future might 
might hold in God's providence. So. Yeah, and I think the, the tradition helps to anchor us yeah. um, so that change isn't just something that flies in and out by the wind, yeah. or it's not just about fashion. It is actually something that is grounded always yeah. in the tradition of the church. And that's a, it's not just you know something you know like a concrete block. It, it it's a living moving. thing. It keeps moving <laughs> and changing, doesn't it? Yeah. There's that word again. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And what, just thinking of the kind of experience we are learning through the growth that we've we've had to undertake this year to, to respond to the COVID nineteen crisis. What what are some of our growth edges? Where are some of the places you've noticed us changing for, for better or for worse? Yeah. So I, I've heard a lot of people sort of almost complaining or sympathising about, you know, lockdown and COVID and ISO, I heard them saying this morning, we're in ISO and, you know, but, uh, and that can start to make us feel really flat and negative about it all. But in the midst of that, we have been forced into a situation of rapid change. I've had to learn new things. I know how to preach to a black dot now. <laughs> <laughs> on your computer. Yeah, yeah, on the iPad, yeah. yeah. Um, and I've learned that um, one of the things that I valued highly was that a sermon needed to be in the context of worship and, you know, no, you can't take my sermon script with you and no, you can't video me on your iPhone. Yeah. And then I've realised that I can reach so many more people by putting it out there. You know, so and so I've learned things, and we've learned things as a parish that missionally we have changed. We, you know, it was forced upon us, but missionally we have changed. We are reaching all these new people through the internet. So that is great. I love that. Um, but the COVID nineteen thing has created a situation for us, particularly in Bass Phillip Island where we have the opportunity to move with a lot of things that we started doing in our visioning day, we had a visioning day in February. Mm. A lot of things that we talked about there, we can actually start to move on those things because we've had all this time to think about it and talk about it in our parish council meetings and so on. Mm. So we've moved forward with things like what times we're going to meet for worship. And, and that again, that's been forced upon us because we haven't worshipped for so long. Mm that now we can start to go, oh, what will we do? What's important to us now? Everything's been stripped back. It's almost like this sort of fellow period. Mm. Yeah. Making room for that germination and that growth that you were speaking about. Definitely, this morning. Yeah. yeah. And that sense of um, where do we go from now is it's been seeded already by what's happened in the visioning day. Another piece of change that we've had is that we started care groups before the lockdown happened. And those care groups have been so successful. They've, if you like, flushed people out that weren't involved much before. Mm. Yeah, so there's a sense of reaching out to people far more broadly than we did before. And they're feeling more cared for and more connected because of the care groups. So that's a change that's been forced upon us, but it's a good one and we're gonna keep doing that. And again, that kind of follows on from something you were teasing out in your sermon earlier about Jesus sending the disciples out to take that good news with them wherever they find themselves. You know, we've, we've had to remember, relearn in a sense that being church is about so much more than what happens on Sunday morning when, when we're worshipping as you know, largely the community of the baptised. But it's about what we do as we join our Sundays to our Mondays. Yeah. Joe, you, your own background, um, I think you got a, a, a career in uh, teaching uh, early on and, and, and in drama and music and we could hear that in your lovely uh, presentation this morning of your, of your, your sermon. Um, and from there you went into I think youth ministry and began to discern a call to ordination. Tell us a little bit about your own journey into faith and then into ordained ministry. So, of course, when a person gets older, those stories seem to um, be longer and full of all the joys and pains of life. Um, but I think significantly for me, having been brought up in an, a family that are atheists, 
um, has been very significant because, and I do thank my sister who um, is two years younger than me, I thank her for being a strong atheist because um, she keeps me grounded. I can't just talk God talk to her. <laughs> You know, there's no Christian bubble in our family. <laughs> so um, not just agnostic. Oh, yeah, right, atheists. argue. Yeah, yeah right. Argue. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the arguing was very important in my formative years. Um, my parents, I don't know why they did this. My mother said it was to finish me and make me into a lady. Um, <laughs> they sent us to Strathcona Baptist Girls Grammar School. And that was um, assembly every morning with hymns and prayers and I think it was on Thursday that a Baptist minister had come and give us a talk and I had to pretend to the um, my friends, my student friends, that I thought it was boring but actually I really enjoyed it because this was like great because yeah. I'd been hearing there is no God and you know that religion is the opiate of the masses and all that sort of thing at the dinner table um, and that well, what we really needed was true freedom you know um, so <laughs> going home each night to the dinner table and arguing, mm. arguing for God, that was very important. Mm. It was a strong thing and it, it, it still is for me. It, when I am in the pub or I'm at the coffee shop or you know at the hairdresser or wherever I find myself, um, invariably I'm bumping up against people who have all sorts of reasons why God doesn't exist or what have you, or you know, they've got a reason for why they don't go to church or they don't believe or you know, whatever. And I've usually got a pretty clever answer. <laughs> I'm not saying I've got the right answer, but I've got an answer that makes them think. Yeah, you engage them. Yeah, Connect. because yeah. I've had a lot of practice <laughs> from back in the teenage days, yeah. yeah. So, and, and with my sister too, yeah. yeah. And Joe, I think you've got a particular one of the things, a lot of things about about um, your context is the uh, the the Grand Prix, the the motorbike Grand, Grand Prix every year, and I think you've got a particular kind of affinity with that and insight into that that world. Tell us a little bit about that story. <laughs> so a lot of my boyfriends were bikies. Now there is a difference between a bike er and a bike e. <laughs> a bike e. How do I put this? Uh, they're, they're pretty tough and they have codes of conduct, um, they, have a very, they have a brotherhood and a, a certain violent aspect to how they behave um, and then there's bikers who just really enjoy motorbikes um, and they might belong to a club. Uh, one of my boyfriends belonged to the Hartwell Motorcycle Club and that was nice and it was sedate compared <laughs> to bikers. Um, so a lot of my boyfriends were bikers and in those days I, I did feel that I needed love and I wanted love and I thought the best way to get that love was to just be there for those, those men. Mm -hmm. Read into that what you will. Um, but you know, as my Christian journey developed I realised that I didn't need to do that. I didn't need that kind of approval and, and love from them, as shallow as that love was. Um, I actually have the love of God and that made a huge difference. That's, that was the biggest change in my life actually. Yeah, right. That was a change, a really important change. And was that a moment or was it a process? A process, a process yeah, yeah, a process. Plus, when you find yourself in the gutter literally, mm -hmm. right, um, there's only one way to go from there. Uh, I just want to add about the biker bikey thing that it, it's actually useful to me now in so many ways. Yeah. I, I talked a minute before about sitting in the pub. Yeah. So on the day of the Grand Prix, I go, it's on a Sunday, so obviously I'm working, but then when I get away from the work, go down to the pub, down to the pub, and you sit there with the big screen watching the race. Yeah. And everybody's around you enjoying that too. And invariably, when you're having a drink, you talk about it. Yeah. And they're like, oh, and you're a priest, and you know about Kawasaki, and you know about you know, Moto Guzzi, and did you really, have, did you really go on that, you know, <laughs> like, pardon? You, so, because I'm sitting there on my collar, 
that they do, and I'm a female as well, yeah. there's a lot of questions asked, and it's just such a great witness yeah. that a person who is faithful and has given themselves to this ministry is real, <laughs> yeah. in their eyes. Yeah. I mean, of course I'm real, but really in their yeah. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I had a, a fabulous experience last year. No, it was the one before, the year before, when I was down there talking to some guys, and they said, are you able to marry people? And I said, yeah, I am. They said, well, could we organise that? Yeah, wow. Could we have a wedding? So we've had a wedding on the beach. Yeah, fantastic. It's just yeah. so nice to yeah. think that that contact helped them and they wanted to have the blessing of God. I mean, I'm not just flipping that no, no, wedding of off. Yeah. You know, I actually have conversations with them and talk about God with them and that the service is going to include prayer and a Bible reading and... Yeah, I just like to think that I've sown a little seed there. You're the face of the church for, for those people. Yeah, I hope so. And, and that I hope so. Might, you know, mm. might not have happened otherwise. So, mm. Yeah, God uses our journey, our, our life experience. It's all part of the Christ, Christ of the Mill of Ministry, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, so what, what about from there, Joe, into into this sense of discernment of a, of a call to holy orders? How did that come about? Well, that was really during my youth ministry train time. So I, I did six years of youth ministry in the Anglican Church at St. Paul's Canterbury. Oh, yeah. And I was under a very lively, wise, experienced priest, Father Paul Black. Yep. And he would be preaching and I'd be listening to it and thinking, gee, I'd like to do that. I just felt that that's what I should do. But even then, I'm like, no, I'm doing youth ministry. That's what I'm doing. Um, and then one day he preached a sermon about the call and how one would understand God's call. And I thought, that means me. That was really it. Yeah. And um, I remember praying about it and thinking, I don't want to hear because I don't want to hear this from God. You know, it's like, I'm not going to listen. You might be calling me to do this, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So I wasn't listening, I wasn't paying attention, and God made me ill. <laughs> he just made me sick. Until I said, okay, yes, I'll do it. Actually, I remember the day that I was kneeling down in prayer, and I just said, okay, I give in, I'll do it. <laughs> Is it a bit like what you were saying this morning about that disease of the heart? Mm. When we're not being true to ourselves or we're not where we're supposed to be, mm. we're not whole, yeah. we're, not, we're not well as God wants us yeah. to be. Is it something like that? Definitely yeah. like that. Type, yeah, so unwell, yeah. not in the physical sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. unwell in my heart, definitely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And what would you say to people who might be watching you know, and, and reflecting on your sermon about growing in the Christian life and Christian discipleship, and you gave us some wonderful practical ways in which we, we can do that this morning. Um, what would you say to people who might be asking those same sort of questions about their own vocation into ministry, be it lay ministry or ordained ministry? How can we listen for that still small voice and, and really kind of tune in and open ourselves to that? So I think you're asking me about prayer. Yeah. So I am a prayerful person. Um, I take my time with God really seriously. Um, I, I'm very fortunate that I have had a fantastic spiritual director. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a Jesuit, uh, no, a Josephite nun. Yeah. And I've been with Sister Jennifer for 20 years now, and she's been helping me with um, Ignatian spirituality. Um, For those who might not know what that means, can you give us the kind of... Oh. I mean, obviously, a spirituality based on the figure of Ignatius. <laughs> <laughs> but it, Probably not fair to try and unpack no. that now because it's a big area. Yeah. Um, Ignatius um, wrote the spiritual exercises yeah. um, and part of the, those exercises involves looking at a piece of scripture and entering into it with one's uh, imagination mm. and 
really letting that seep into oneself mm. um, and then recognising where that is impacting life. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I hope that's explaining no, no, it that's, a bit. That's really um, and very important in doing the exercises but also in praying to journal and keep um, keep a book of it's called the listening book. So you read you you pray, I pray, I listen to um, what I'm being told in prayer, write that down. Mm. And then because it's a listening book it's important to go back and look at it again and how so the discernment process I think comes from there. Yeah. And it's as you describe it, it's actually quite methodical. It's mm. quite a disciplined, it's not mm. just a kind of feeling or a you know, there's something there's mm. there's method to it mm. and, and, and discipline. Yeah. Is that I mean twenty years with the spiritual director, that's a really substantial mm. piece of work. Is that a kind of is that a sort of spiritual discipline that you would commend to others, the, the discipline of, of spiritual direction? Absolutely. Yeah. You can, I feel like I've weathered the storms far better because I've had spiritual direction, but also um, I have professional supervision. So I've been with uh, a professional super, supervisor for that length of time as well. Yeah. So these are times when I sit down with one person and I get to talk to them about all the things that have been bugging me, all the things that I'm struggling with, but and all the joys and pains of life as a priest. And putting them out there somehow makes them make sense again. It's almost like it's all a mess and then, well, it gets all tidied up. Yeah. And I can go forward yeah. with confidence. And your stuff doesn't get in the way of other people's stuff. That is the yeah. most important thing. Sometimes when I tell people in my congregation that I'm going for my usual appointments, I'm going to see my supervisor and my spiritual director, they look at me as if to say, is there something wrong with you that you have to, you know, because you obviously need to get fixed yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I go, no, actually, I'm going to the spiritual director and to the supervisor to make sure that I am psychologically and spiritually healthy. Because if I'm not, there's a risk, isn't there, that I'm going to abuse you, I'm going to try and get my own needs met yeah, through so my parishioners or through my ministry. That's no good. That's where abuse starts. So it's important for me to be healthy within myself, psychologically and spiritually, because then I'm going to do a better job for you. Yeah. It's best practice, isn't it? I mean, social workers do it, psychologists do it, why wouldn't clergy do it? And in fact, we are rolling that out you know, in a more kind of structured way in the diocese. And it's one of the big learnings out of the Royal Commission for precisely the, the reasons you say, the importance of all of us being under regular professional supervision. So thanks for modelling that for us, Joe. Thanks for modelling uh, in your leadership the things that you uh, preached about this morning in terms of growth in the, in the Christian life and, and the, the journey of discipleship. For your ministry in Bass Phillip Island and for your ministry to the southern region of the diocese and your ministry to us all today. Really grateful. Safe home. Thank Blessings. You. Thank you very much.